Hey, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And this week we want to talk about a phenomenon that we've seen come up in self-typing or self-profiling, especially after people learn about the concept of cognitive functions. It is not uncommon for a person to have rested into a type in the Myers-Briggs system and then discover cognitive functions and then start questioning their type because they don't identify with the inferior process or what we call in the car model, the three-year-old process. They don't identify with it as a huge weakness for them or something that would be only at a three-year-old level or something that would be, they would be unconsciously incompetent at. So one of the things we wanted to do on this podcast, and especially for people who are going through the process of trying to figure out their type and really getting confused by how all these cognitive functions are supposed to be showing up for them, and in particular getting confused by how the inferior process is supposed to be showing up for them, we wanted to go through each of the eight functions and talk about what it looks like when it's not an inferior process. When a person is capable of taking each of these functions to their highest levels, to basically the acme of ability, and then if you're trying to determine whether or not you're a certain type, whether or not that specific cognitive function for that type is your inferior process, gauge to see if this is like that acme, if that's something that you believe is honestly within your reach, that you have the natural talent for it, and all it is is a matter of skill development, and whether or not you feel like you would even care enough to get to that highest acme level of that function. Because I think a lot of times what we do is we feel like oh, it's just a matter of learning how to do that and I'd totally be able to do that. But the question is, would you even care enough to do it? Because when a cognitive function is in either the dominant or auxiliary um, positions or what we call the driver or co-pilot in the car model, when it occupies those spaces, usually we have an impetus to pursue it as far down the rabbit hole as we can go. We want to build our talent up. We want to develop those skills so that we can get to the highest levels. But if it's a what's called the tertiary or inferior process or what we call the 10-year-old or three-year-old in the car car model, we're a lot less interested at taking it to those great heights. So the two things we really want you to gauge when we're going over each of these functions is to ask yourself if you believe you honestly have what it takes, the intrinsic talent to get to these ACME levels is just a matter of skill development. And the second question is, do you even care? Is it something you would even be interested enough to develop? Yeah. And also, if you're a new listener, just want to make sure you understand this is a little bit more of a technical podcast. So if you haven't had any reference to what we're talking about, the best thing to do is right now is pause this because you're like, I'm confused. What's happening? Go over to personalityhacker.com and type in the search bar there, car model. The car model will pop up and it'll give you a reference point to some of the things we're talking about today. And again, if you're looking at that car model or if you've seen that before, we're talking about the inferior or the three-year-old position in the car model. So in the car model, it'll be at the bottom left quadrant of that car model is the position we're talking about in general for you. Now, each type is going to have a different different version of this, different cognitive, technically called cognitive function in that spot. And we'll go through each of these, but that's what we're talking about today. And you, we get tons of emails all the time of people saying, okay, I thought I knew my type. And then you guys started talking about these things called cognitive functions, which is basically just the mental wiring of your mind, how you're perceiving or learning information, how you're judging on that information or making those decisions. That's how your mind is working. All your behaviors arise from that. And when you start to understand how your mind is wired, we get emails in, like Antonio just mentioned, that people say, I I thought I was this type, but now you you gave me this whole new level of understanding my personality. Now I'm even more confused than ever because I identify with so much of this in my car, so much of this in my what's called the cognitive function stack. And so today we're specifically talking about that inferior process. We call it the three-year-old in the car model. And if you if you have things coming up for you where you feel like that's part of your personality, it's supposed to be a very small, you know, maybe three-year-old type part of your personality. But you're like, man, this is significant for me. I feel like this shows up in my life a lot. I might even have some skill developed here. That can cause a lot of confusion. So that's why we want to address this today. Help you sort out some of the confusion you might have around some of the talent or the skill you have in something that, at least on paper, shouldn't be that represented in your life. It shouldn't show up for you as much as it does. And you're like, this is throwing me way off. Well, hopefully today, this podcast will help you with that. I think this particularly comes up for people who are in situations 
where their environment or context required them to go to their inferior process a lot. So this might be a family where everybody else was a certain type. Maybe it was a, they were all types that were really, you know, that used this, you know, what your inferior process is. They all used it, you know, all the time. Like it was maybe a, the family culture to be in that space. And so you were forced to be in that space a lot more often than was comfortable for you. And so you did have a, a higher level of skill developed in something that you may not have otherwise naturally chosen to develop skill. I think this happens a lot when we're in countries or cultures that also favor certain skills. And so we don't have a lot of permission to be in our dominant or driver process as much. And so we are forced to visit that inferior process a lot. So there are situations, I mean, type is not type is not type. Like each person of every personality type is a complex human being with an infinite array of experiences and influencers and situations. So a person of a certain type is not going to look like everybody else of that type. There are going to be things that you have in common. There's going to be trends. There is a predictable pattern to how your mind is wired. But that doesn't mean that you're going to have all had the same experiences. So it's going to show up identical for you. So that's why it's important to really master these concepts around these cognitive functions and understand how they really, really you know, authentically, honestly show up. And not to overvalue maybe some of the more general descriptions, which all of us content writers around Reiner's Briggs and cognitive functions are going to have to present them in a pretty generic way, since we are talking to an infinite array of people represented within each type. We're going to have to have those more general descriptions available so that it, it sort of averages out. So no matter where you're at in your type's bell curve of development, health, self-awareness that it's still going to resonate with you so you lose a little bit of the accuracy but you you heightened the accessibility and that's just as content creators you just have to do that however it does mean that it can create if people are like really getting granular and really nuanced in their understandings it can create some confusion so that's one of the reasons why we want to go through the cognitive functions as they look at the acme so that you can compare it to whether or not you feel that that's something that is accessible for you um, or even available to you to get to the acme of that function and if the answer is no then it might be a, a shadow process for you and that's also a sign that it might be your inferior process even if on some of the more general levels you still identified with it let me give you an example real quick just so you have an idea of like you can put it in a framework of an actual real life example let's say you're an infj and i tell you as an infj that your inferior process is technically called extroverted sensing. It's got the development of about a three-year-old child. And in your personality, we, we've nicknamed this sensation. It's all about in touch with your body in the real moment, in the present moment, in real-time kinesthetic type activities, being able to read a situation, read body language. You're not in your head at all. You're fully present in your body. And as an INFJ, you say, you know, I like my introverted time. I like my high-minded ideas. I like to really study and learn and let my mind drift and wander. But there's a part of me that really resonates with, with what you're saying. I love to be in my body. I love to go on a long bike ride. I love to spend time in physical activity, maybe lifting weights at the gym or long runs or bike rides or something active or even dancing or expressing myself some way. I identify with that extroverted sensing, that sensation process you're talking about, Joel. And you say, maybe I'm not an INFJ. Maybe I'm an ESFP or an ISFP. I, this shows up for me so much. Maybe I've mistyped myself all along and I'm actually not an INFJ. Well, what we're saying to you is that that part of you, that inferior part of you, is still going to show up in a significant way for a lot of people. The question is, if you were doing that process at its best, in other words, if you were an ESFP or an ISFP uh, or an ESTP or an ISTP, and that was either your primary or secondary process, your driver or auxiliary or your co-pilot process, are you showing up as an INFJ with a sophistication that would be there if it was a higher represented process. So we want to go through each of the processes today. And I guess we could start with SE, we could start with extroverted sensing, sensation, and, and look at that first since I just gave that example. Are you using it to its fullest expression? Is it, the, is it your strength or is it just something that's significantly a part of your personality? Yeah, because I've seen this a lot, especially I think even in INTJs where the extroverted thinking or effectiveness process has them really honor you know, like 
working out or they recognize that their body is an instrument so they have to take care of it and so sometimes even like INTJs can get confused over whether or not sensation or extroverted sensing is their inferior so let's talk about sensation or extroverted sensing at its height one of the easiest ways to to see what it can look like at its best is to see examples of people of the types that have this as either a dominant or auxiliary or driver co-pilot process and to see where they've gone when they've taken it to the greatest levels. So for me, one of the first people that shows up in my mind is I think of Michael Jackson and the extraordinary control he had over his body, his, his voice as an instrument, his body as an instrument, his level of performance, it, just go look for examples of Michael Jackson in a very casual setting, beatboxing in an interview. Incredible. And it's ridiculous. Like the dude just turned his entire body into an instrument. That's one thing I think of. Then I also think of uh, who was the ath- the Olympic runner who broke the four minute mile barrier. I don't remember the guy's name, but okay. I know who you're talking about. It totally escapes me. I know I know his name, but I just can't think of it. Somebody in the podcast notes is, or like in the comments is going to be like, oh, it was this dude. And I'll be like, I know. I just forgot about it temporarily for two seconds. Anyway, but that guy breaking the four minutes barrier for, for the four minute mile. And then as soon as he did it, all of a sudden now a bunch of people were doing it. Being able to get at a level of athleticism, like physical prowess, where it almost feels inhuman is very much sensation or extroverted sensing at its height. And then it's also things like being able to taste a couple spices that you've never tasted before and then turn it into a ridiculously delicious dish or being able to pick up any instrument. You know, if you're musically inclined, being able to pick up any instrument and just play it just naturally. My cousin Nathan ESTP and he actually got in a bike accident once. We were riding bicycles. His bike tire popped, flipped over his handles, hit the ground, rolled, then stood straight up grabbed his bike, picked it back up, almost like it hadn't even happened. If that happened to me, I'd be dead. Like that was crazy. I saw him just do that in real time. Like the ground came at him and he responded immediately. This is what this is what this process can do. Yeah, it's it's being so in touch with your physical environment and your body that you can improvise at a level that is almost unbelievable to other people. And so, you know, if you're an INJ and you're like, oh no, I'm really good at cooking. You know, I can totally do that. The question is, if you were given a bunch of ingredients that you had never tasted before and all you had to do was just taste each thing just once and then you can whip up an amazing meal. Now, obviously, that's not just talent, that's skill development. You have to be a person who is trained in the art of cooking. It's the ability to do what you talk about, Joel, which is not just reading, but also writing. So it's not just an ability to like pick up pick up cues in the environment it's also the ability to create those cues in the environment it's not just an ability to read a situation it's an ability to write or create the situation based on this process and you might even be an infj that says i can do that i can taste a bunch of different spices one time and whip up a great meal and and you might have just done that all your life you might be in a context where that's possible so you one of these specific examples might resonate with you but do all of them resonate with you? Is it transferable? Would be the other question, I think. Because as far as being able to do that in that cooking situation, you might have done that your whole life. Your mom might have been a great cook and taught you how to do this. And you can just, that's part of where you focus that sensing process, that sensation process on. Is it transferable just to walk over to like a bike and pick it up and ride it or grab a saxophone and just start punching out notes by hearing them back to yourself? Is that skill transferable across different disciplines? from the same cognitive function process is the question. Right, because like your brother, he's an ESFP. He can, I mean, he's like an extraordinary athlete. He has to be at the gym every day. He can pick up any instrument and start playing it. He like, like can cook anything at any time. Like his his extroverted sensing process is so much about a part of his daily experience that it's just transferable in all these different contexts. So I think that, that brings up a really good point. When we talk about each of these functions at their ACME, you might have skill developed in one of these forms of the cognitive function, like one of its applications or one of its expressions, but do you have it in all of its expressions? And would you be interested in taking it to the highest level? Like, is that something that is incredibly important to you? So uh, again, like 
it's a matter of really being honest with yourself and asking yourself if you have the not not just the skill developed but like the natural talent and the skill and the interest to be able to take it to its best let's take the next one that's sometimes very difficult it's also an extroverted process it has a tendency to trip people up which is extroverted thinking or what we call effectiveness. Now, this would be the inferior or three-year-old process for IFP, so ISFPs and INFPs. And I think extroverted thinking as an inferior process trips a lot of people up because our, at least in the country we live in and most of the developed world, extroverted thinking or effectiveness is very highly prized and it's very pushed. So we have a tendency to develop it even if it's, say, not a dominant auxiliary process for us, or maybe if it's even a shadow process like it is for me. It's not even in my car model. It's not in my cognitive function stack, but I know that I was very pushed toward it as well. So this can be one that trips people up. One of my favorite ways of explaining extroverted thinking at its like highest levels is the extraordinary, just mind-boggling engineering feat of creating a super highway system. Like that's crazy. To be able to create a super highway system with all the on ramps and off ramps and being able to do it in a sustainable way, meaning like this is the road system we're going to have for the next hundred years and the project management that's required to do that, because like there's one person at the top of all of that. There is one person who's fundamentally and ultimately responsible for that thing to happen. So they have to do all of the top grading. They have to do all of the, or like basically top grading, meaning that they have to hire the people that they trust who will be able to get each part of that engineering process handled. The architects, the actual, you know, the engineers, the people who do the physical heavy lifting, all the project management that goes into that is, as far as I'm concerned, a her- Herculean feat. Oh, yeah. But there's one person who's responsible for all that. So if you are a person who is leading with introverted feeling or authenticity, so you're an IFP, ask yourself if that's something that you feel that you have enough natural talent in extroverted thinking, enough desire to build the skill, and enough desire to become the kind of person who would do such a project. My guess is that that sounds pretty overwhelming. It sounds overwhelming to me, and I'm not... I don't even lead with introverted feeling or authenticity, but that's, that is where it can go as it's like acme as its highest levels is being the person who does project, who does, who's the final call, the final buck stops here on the project management of designing an entire, you know, like freeway system. In order to do that, you have to depersonalize people to some degree, see them as resources. These aren't just people anymore. These are people that can get something done. And the people you're dealing with when you are an effectiveness driver or even co-pilot, they are just almost like entities in themselves or little systems or resources themselves. They're not, they, they, I mean, they don't cease to become people to you, but they are resources that need to be managed and manipulated and moved toward a goal together. And that's tough for an authenticity primary person to think, in people, think of people in those terms. That just doesn't resonate with you. Yeah, most well, likely. yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, so somebody's house is in the way of the freeway. So you have to go negotiate with them to like move their house or sell, you know, buy them out or try to convince them to move their house for this freeway system. And so, you know, you, you might have to displace people. You might have to negotiate and play hardball. <laughs> like there's a lot of stuff that goes into that level of project management that would probably be rather distasteful to somebody who is using authenticity. Another example would be somebody who's like a five star general in the military. Is that something that you would even want to do? Yeah. I mean, if you're, again, if you're an authenticity person, someone that uses this as your main decision-making function, oftentimes seeing things and just accomplishing tasks for their own sake, you might have some skill, just like we talked about before. You might have some skill in getting certain things done because you wired yourself that way. But is it transferable to multiple different disciplines? And you'll notice literally people who are in the military, generals will graduate from there when they retire, often go into civil service roles where they help manage big highway projects and other things because the skill is transferable and it's something they enjoy doing. It puts them in flow. So just because your inferior shows up for you doesn't mean it's transferable. I think that's another key there. Is it is it, its ultimate height and is it transferable? Mm. So the next one we can talk about is extroverted feeling or harmony. And this would be the inferior process for people who lead with introverted thinking or accuracy. So I, ITPs, INTPs and ISTPs. And when I think of extroverted feeling at the top of its game, I mean, you might feel, even if you're leading with 
accuracy or introverted thinking, you might feel like, yeah, I can kind of read other people's emotions. You know, some, I mean, especially with extroverted feelings, sometimes it can be pretty obvious. <laughs> if a person is really, like really emoting, that can be super obvious that, yeah, I, I can tell that they're obviously experiencing an emotion and I can tell that it's anger or sadness. However, and you might even feel like you can walk into a room and to some extent get the culture of the room. But when I think of somebody who's at the top of their game with extroverted feeling, think, or excuse me, extroverted feeling or harmony, I think of what is his name? He's he has his own reality TV show where he is a wedding planner. David, oh, names are escaping me. And I've got my phone off, so I can't like quickly Google it <laughs> and cheat. Um, I should have probably written this down beforehand. But uh, he is a person who is a wedding planner extraordinaire. So not only, uh, you can tell, not only is he managing every detail of this wedding and all these people work for him and he's the person who fundamentally creates the vision and makes sure that every every piece that the bride and groom have said that they want in their wedding, he ensures that it all gets handled and shows up the way that they said that they wanted it. But during the the entire episode, He's also managing the emotions of the bride and managing the emotions of the groom and managing the emotions of the wedding party to make sure that they're getting everything they want. So he is meeting their needs at an ascended level. I think of the character Joan from Mad Men and how she so effortlessly anticipated everybody's needs and they were just met. Yeah. Extroverted feeling or harmony when it's at its best like it's very easy to not appreciate it because things are just happening around you. It almost becomes like a black swan. The only time you notice you notice it is when it's not happening. Like right. When you're a kid and mom doesn't make lunch, you're like, where's lunch? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, otherwise, like lunch just appears and you're like, oh, there's lunch. So when extroverted feeling is at the top of its game, it has the ability to bring enormous groups together. I think of also Oprah, right? the ability to create an enormous group of people who are all feeling very connected around like maybe a single vision or a single set of values and also being able to identify and anticipate their needs, being able to do so while also managing the group's emotions. Like there's a level of ascension that extroverted feeling or harmony gets to that the question that a person who's an ITP would want to ask themselves is would they even care? Like, being able to help somebody through an emotional experience, being able to read a room to some extent, being able to, you know, be uh, identify an emotion that another person is experiencing or even manage your own emotions. These are all elements of it, but would you be able to get to that acme? Yeah, I think of, uh, so, and again, if you're an ITP, an INTP or an ISTP, you might have some skill developed around harmony, this inferior process of yours. I think of my friend Christian in Miami. I was hanging out with him this past winter and Christian's an INTP. He and I were talking. He's developed this extraordinary ability to be very social with people in the real world. He has He's trained himself to be able to go up to anyone and talk to them in real life. And that's a lot of frightening times for a lot of INTPs. They're like, I don't, I don't know if I can just put myself out there a lot. And Christian has actually disciplined himself in order to be able to approach people cold on the streets or in a coffee shop or wherever and talk to anyone to the point where as an ENFP, I was like wowed by some of the things he was doing where I don't even feel like I have that permission to do that extroverted experience of talking to somebody, just cold approaching them up and saying, hey, how's it going? So I was really admiring the skill he's developed. Now, is that skill transferable to everything in his life? We were talking about some emotional things for me on my side in a conversation and I mentioned something emotional about something resonating. And he was like, what, what do you mean resonating? It didn't, it didn't make sense to him. He didn't think in emotional terms. But he still has a skill developed around this particular area in his life. So again, is it transferable? And would you want to do it at its highest? Like wedding planner. I'm guessing my friend Christian would not want to be a wedding planner. He wouldn't want to have to manage people's emotions on a mass scale. But yet he's got that one skill built. So I could see somebody as an ITP saying, maybe I'm not an ITP. Maybe there's something different about it. Maybe, I've, maybe I'm more people oriented than I thought because I have this skill developed in this inferior process. So just watch out for that. So the next one we can talk about, just finishing off the extroverted cognitive functions, is extroverted intuition or what we call exploration. So this would be the dominant process for ENPs and it would be the inferior process or the three-year-old process for ISJs, so ISTJs and ISFJs. Now, there is a certain level of creativity that comes along with exploration, which I've noticed a lot of ISJs tap into. 
probably in particular, well, no, actually, I was going to say in particular ISFJs, but that's just because I notice it more in ISFJs. But there's also a level of creativity definitely within ISTJs. An ISJ might get a description of extroverted intuition with a a level of creativity or possibly a level of, of adventurousness. And the ISJ might go, well, I love to travel. So maybe that's not my inferior process. Or I like to try new foods. So then maybe that's not my three-year-old. Maybe I'm a different type. When I think of extroverted intuition or exploration at its epoch, the two people who come up to, my, to mind for me are Chris Guillebeau, who is the guy who runs the Art of Nonconformity. He has officially traveled to every single country on the planet. Like it was a big deal for him a couple years ago. I'm on his email list and he sent an email out. He's like, well, I did it. I traveled to every single country on the planet. Now he had to go to great lengths to design a life in which that was possible for him. Some countries he actually had to sneak into. Yeah. Because you you were just not allowed to go in those countries. He had to actually cross the border under the cover of darkness to make it happen. Yeah. And so as an ISJ, is that something you would be interested in doing? Creating entire life around making sure that you hit every country before you die. Another person I think of is Robin Williams, who was able to improvise content for an extended amount of time on stage. Now, you might be, you might have some improvisational abilities. You might have, as an ISJ, taught yourself to be able to kind of do things on the fly or be creative or be spontaneous. But the question would be, would you be able to come up with or generate content like the microphone goes on and you're just able to generate content for literally hours at a time? Would you have the ability to do that? Now, obviously, that's skill development as well as natural talent. But the combination of the two is what gets people at their acme. So would you be able to be at the acme of extroverted intuition or exploration? And the the next question is, would you even care? Like, would that be something that you would spend the time and effort into designing because it's important to you? Yeah, my friend Scott is an ISFJ, and he is better at improv than I am. We took an improv class about three years ago together. And he's amazing. Like he can do formalized improv, like on stage in an improv setting. He's so much better at improv than I am. He can just dominate it. He's built skill around that particular ability to get up and improvise on a stage. And I don't know if he, I haven't really talked to him, but my guess is he wouldn't be comfortable with just sitting down and teaching a class for two hours off the top of his head without being a little bit more prepared than just winging it because that's something he hasn't spent time practicing. So for him, I feel like he'd be much more comfortable having some notes in that format. So is it transferable for him? It'd be the question. Yeah. In a situation for extroverted intuition, it's an ability to deal well with novelty and improvisation. So for exploration or extroverted intuition types, it is a skill, excuse me, there's a natural talent. And then there's also a natural proclivity to build skill and being able to handle yourself no matter what the novelty is. Yeah. Just like with sensation or extroverted sensing, it's an ability to handle yourself no matter what the environment requires of your body. It's an ability to handle a situation that you've never been in and just, you know, almost act like you've been there your whole life. And that's extroverted intuition or exploration at its at its acme. So as an ISJ, you have to ask yourself, is that something that you feel is is not only natural talent, skill you've built a desire to build the skill and maybe even reframe your entire life to be able to build that skill and you have the ability to transfer it in any situation that is novel. Yeah, and you can see from all these examples, I'm giving some concrete examples of real people I know in my life who are excellent at certain areas of their inferior process, which is so weird. You don't think of that as something you can become excellent in, but that happens. You can build excellence in this process and that can be a big trip up when you're when you're typing. So let's talk about the introverted cognitive functions in this same position, in the inferior position, or in the three-year-old position of the car stack. Right. So one of the first one that, ones that comes up for me is introverted sensing, probably because that's my inferior three-year-old. Introverted sensing is the ability to understand who you are based on your experiences from the past, or who we all are based on our experiences from the past. It's a desire to build precedence and to be able to create procedures to effectively have you know, order from chaos in a lot of different ways and to honor traditions from the past. Now, as an ENP, I haven't seen as many ENPs get tripped up or confused by this, uh, having like an association with the past. However, I have observed at times questions that come up because 
maybe an ENFP or an ENTP maybe has a really strong tie to their family or maybe has a really strong tie to the memories that were built during holidays in their youth. Maybe they had a really positive upbringing or maybe they had a very negative upbringing and they feel tied to the past. I've also seen them, you know, get to a level of organization where they don't feel like they're constantly being, you know, I don't know, jerked around by their dominant process of, of seeking novelty, where they have an ability to be rooted. And so they might question whether or not they're truly an ENP. They might think maybe they're a judger type because they do have some association with that desire to create some sort of order in their lives. Yeah, I've typed out as a judger. I have this ability, like in our business... So my inferior process as an ENFP is also introverted sensing or memory, what we call it here at Personality Hacker. And I have this ability to, one of the things I do in our business in Personality Hacker is I make a procedure for everything to everyone else's annoyance, like a step-by-step procedure. Like how do we you know, process this thing with our customers? How do we do customer service? And what do we do in this situation? And I have like this procedure list, one through 17 steps a little video that goes with it. It takes me about three or four hours to put something like this together. I'm totally stressed out by the time I'm done with it, but I have the ability to create this. It's not something that I would want to do all the time. I would never want to be put in charge of like a DMV or like licensing procedures for government institutions or anything. But I have enough of this part of me that I've channeled it into business that I can create procedures and operations manuals in our business. Again, it stresses me out like crazy. I don't think it's transferable, but I've got a skill developed there. Mm-hmm. And if I wasn't more in touch with who my person, what my personality was, I might think, well, maybe I'm not an ENFP. I've got this such strong ability to create procedures, and it's so important to me and for our business. Maybe I'm a different type would come up for me. Well, and the other thing is that you're also very insistent that we all capture all of our information, and we make sure to make notes on everything. And you're actually really good at ensuring that you capture all of the pieces of, I mean like anything that could be possibly be important you take pictures of every single piece of artwork that our children make like you take a picture of it and archive it archiving is very important to you yeah. <laughs> you're actually a, a pretty a pretty good archivist I'm terrible I have definitely not put my eggs in that basket um, but I could see an ENP maybe going down the same you know road that you did and going maybe I'm really good at this But let's take introverted sensing at its acme. What does it look like when it's at its height? And when I think of it at its height, the image that always comes to mind is Martha Stewart, who has turned the ability to create good memories, she has turned it into an enormous business. She's able to have templates that she shares with other people in order to replicate these amazing experiences. How do you make the holidays the best? How do you make your home amazing? How do you create a world where everybody feels like they're taken care of? Now, that's a particularly ISFJ way of going about it, but it's still at a heightened ACME level. Another example could be whoever is in charge of the cataloging of the Library of Congress. That is a person who I am certain is at the top of their game when it comes to the introverted sensing process. So the question is, would I ever want to be that level of um, archivist? Would I ever want to be at the level where I am in charge of all of those pieces of information and making sure that they're organized and available to other people and have all those procedures implemented? And the answer is absolutely not. There is no way that I would ever want to build my life around developing skill based on that level of talent. And, and again, it's transferable. It's the ability to, you know, not only create a, like a, a situation for yourself where you're really in touch with the past and really understand those, all of those things, but it's also a, a transferable to maybe being able to no, have be the person who's the keeper of the family tree in your family and so you know every single person on both sides of your family tree and you're the person who keeps all of those that memorabilia and you're the person who's responsible every family reunion to bring all that content and information and just be who everybody goes to to find out what their ancestry is I can't imagine wanting to be that person and yet people who are excellent with the skill they love it and they're really good at it I remember when I got a subscription to Ancestry.com for a small amount of time and used it like maybe for three months and was kind of interested in it and was kind of getting in touch with my introverted sensing or memory process. I I was, uh, it did not take long before I started to kind of peter out. And I had a person who was an introverted sensing dominant, an ISFJ, go, I will totally help you with this. I love doing this for people. So it's an ability to not just read it, quote unquote, but also write it. 
a person who is doing this for other people, like as far as I'm concerned, introverted sensing or memory is a very personal thing for me. I would never reach out and do it for other people because it's already a bit of a strain to do it for myself. It's an ability to reach out and create it for others as well, not just for yourself, but not just read it for yourself, but also write it for others. And if you are an ENP, ask yourself if that's something that would even be interesting enough to pursue. So the next cognitive function is introverted feeling or what we call authenticity. And this would be the three-year-old or inferior process for ETJs, ENTJs and ESTJs. Introverted feeling, when it's done well, is about being in touch with how things are making you feel. And this can show up in a couple different ways. Oftentimes it shows up in ethical considerations and creating convictions around things. And another way it shows up is in artistic self-expression, since you are in touch with parts of you that are languageless. And so you end up communicating what's going on for you to other people by creating some sort of art that helps replicate the emotion or mirror the emotion. When ETJs feel like they, or question whether or not they're ETJs, when they read descriptions of introverted feeling as the three-year-old or inferior process, oftentimes it's because they do have a sense of conviction. They do feel very strongly about right and wrong and whether or not things should or should not be. And they also can get very into, especially if they're using it therapeutically, they can get into art and self-expression. And so there might be a component of art and self-expression that they identify with and they go, hmm, maybe I'm not authenticity or introverted feeling inferior. So as an ETJ, you might ask yourself, you know, maybe I'm not an ETJ. Maybe I have more of this authenticity represented in my life than I think. Well, think about people who do authenticity well. I think of Tony Robbins, who I I type as an ENFP most likely, and he can hold three, four, five-day workshops where he not only can read emotions, but he's writing, like we talk about, writing those emotions for days at a time, where he's holding an emotion for crowds of people, helping them get into an emotional space just from his pure energetic essence for days and days and days. He's getting people to feel emotions, feel certain ways. If you are an ETJ, is that something that you think you could do at the top of your game, make people feel emotions for that long of a sustained amount of time at that level? And my guess is it's something you wouldn't even be interested in doing, let alone be developed a skill at doing. Now, you might, again, each of these types have something you've got developed a skill around one specific aspect of this cognitive function or process. A lot of times that can show up. But is it transferable? Can you do it on a really high level? And can you do it a diff- bunch of different disciplines on cross-disciplinary ways? I think that'd be the question to ask yourself. Yeah, I think of artists who will close themselves off from all of reality for days and days and then just create these extraordinary works of art by having shut everything else out and make these works of art that other people observe and burst into tears when they see them or just like mirror this ridiculously intense emotion. We had an ENTJ show up to a business we were involved in many years ago. And he came in uh, with this idea. He had just learned about emotional keto, like emotional mapping and things of this nature. So he sat down with us at this company because we had some internal conflict. He said, I'm going to solve these problems for you. We're going to solve this. We're going to spend one, two days to do this. And we all worked on our emotions. We wrote emotions out. We told each other how we felt. We were working through this. And this guy was actually pretty good at holding space. His ENTJ guy was good at holding space for about two full days. And I even warned him. I said, you know, there's a lot of trouble in the company. You know, we're having some struggles internally. And he's like, no, it's fine. We got this. And about the end of day two, he realized that it was just continual emotion. These things were not getting resolved. Certain aspects of people's conflict, it just wasn't going to happen without a lot more time, a lot more effort put into it. And I saw him almost power down at the end of day two and go, okay, we got to get down to work. This whole like, you know, this whole emotion bull crap, I'm done with it. I can't do this any longer. And he actually sustained it for a while, but he couldn't do it beyond that second day. And he just went like, all right, let's change tack. Let's start doling out assignments now. And he started just giving people assignments on what to do. And we just abandoned the whole emotional thing because it just started spiraling out of control for him to be able to manage it on that level. So he could do it for a while. He'd actually developed some skill around it. He couldn't do it for a sustained amount of time beyond the two-day mark. Yeah. And I I would say that it was not a transferable skill to him Yeah, because he had trouble in his relationships he had trouble really connecting with other people and on an emotional level he ended up like that's something that he ended up pursuing was some work around that because it wasn't something that came to him naturally 
So not to say that all ETJs have trouble with emotions or relationships. However, when you look at what introverted feeling does when it's at the top of its game and how much emotion mapping it automatically does and how much holding space it automatically does and how much humanizing it automatically does. When you get to that heightened level of being able to hold emotional space for groups of thousands of people, like you talked about with Tony Robbins, being able to help people replicate these really intense emotional experiences, being able to maybe even in a counseling or coaching or therapy session, hold space for somebody who has had you know is in a post-traumatic stress disorder situation where they need they need space held for them for maybe six months a year two years and the person who's using authenticity or introverted feeling is just just there for them and just holding space for them holding space through a situation that other people would maybe have long abandoned and then again being able to not just read it but also write it help the person not only deal with and process their emotions but then find their way back to an emotion that will give them a higher quality of life the question that a person who's leading with effectiveness needs to ask themselves is is that something they could do and in our cult- culture and society it's really easy to value maybe even overvalue the talent it takes to you know build an entire freeway system and not value the ability to help an individual work through post-traumatic stress disorder from truly horrifying events and, and doing it through years, years of work. We have a tendency to value one over the other. And so for a person who's using introverted feeling as a dominant process, an IFJ, I mean IFP, they might have a tendency to think they have more effectiveness built up because we reward that a lot. And an ETJ might not identify as much with introverted feeling or authenticity because there's less external reward for it. However, and that, and that might be a component in whether or not people get confused around their types. I've noticed that IFPs tend to be more confused around their types than ETJs are. However, there are contexts and situations where introverted feeling or authenticity can be highly rewarded. So if you're an ETJ that has been, you know, in a situation that's been forced to do a lot of emotional work, you might be a person who has questions around whether or not this is your inferior process. And the, the question again is, do you have the natural talent? Do you have the skill development? Do you have the patience um, to change your entire life around to build that skill development? And is it transferable? Can you both read it and write it? The next cognitive function, the second to the last cognitive function is introverted thinking. This one actually sometimes trips people up who are EFJs because the description for introverted thinking or accuracy and EFJs, ENFJs and ESFJs will have it as their three-year-old or inferior process is usually described in very basic terms around being good at math or science or being rational or reasonable or being able to teach or learn. And these are all very desirable qualities to people. Maybe not so much like an insistence on math, but the ability to be reasonable and rational is something that everyone wants to think about themselves. And so for EFJs, they might recognize their ability to be reasonable and rational, which they, you know, everybody has that capacity within them. So really understanding introverted thinking or accuracy at its acme is, I think, pretty beneficial for people who are questioning whether or not this is their inferior three-year-old process. Introverted thinking or accuracy at the top of its game is able to not only maintain and hold insane amounts of data, it's able to clean slice insane amounts of data, to be able to see things as pure in a data sense as possible. And that's what makes them good at hard sciences and math, although it doesn't have to be applied in that way. One of the ways to see introverted thinking or accuracy at the top of its game is to look at some of the greatest debaters of all time. People who are excellent, excellent at debating, like at a level where they can they can almost take any topic. I've watched debates that are televised people who are are like extraordinarily good at debating and they'll be given a topic and have almost zero preparation time and they have to go up and they have to take a for or against position. Now that means that they have to completely remove what their emotional attachment to that is. Like you might have to debate for or against something that you personally don't agree with and yet you still have to come, you know, come up with some very clear, concise, you know, very, um, persuasive arguments for or against something that you might not even personally believe in. But it's the ability to separate your own emotional attachments, social attachments, anything that you believe is clouding the data 
It's the ability to look at the data as is. So it goes beyond just being a reasonable person. You know, an EFJ can be a reasonable person. They can learn a lot about a subject. They can even be interested in things like math and science. Like that's not out of their, you know, their league. I know EFJs that actually are scientists. So it's not their, it's not an inability for them to access that part of them. And they might have some skill developed. But is it a transferable skill? Is it the ability to clean slice data no matter what? Is it the ability to like be grueling in you know, looking at incongruities and inconsistencies and completely remove your emotional attachment from it. I think of people who are into like quantum physics, people who are at the highest levels of heightened mathematics, mathematics at a level where most of us don't even understand what the language is anymore. The ability to go down that level, like to get to that level, do you have the natural talent? Do you have the skill developed? Do you have a desire to have the skill developed on that level? Would you change your entire life in order to build the skill to be at that level? And is it transferable? Is it the ability to do provide that service to maybe somebody who comes to you with a personal problem or relationship problem and to be able to go, oh, I think this is actually what's going on. You know, you, you say it's this and he says it's this, but it's actually what this is like the thing that's going on right here. It's the ability to diagnose situations and diagnose problems and challenges in a number of different contexts. And if you don't have the ability to transfer or translate all those skills, if you don't have the desire to change your entire life around to develop the skill to be able to capitalize on that talent, then you probably, it's okay if you acknowledge that you are introverted thinking or accuracy inferior. Finally, let's talk about the last function that we're going to talk about today, which is it's abbreviated NI. Technical name is introverted intuition. We've nicknamed it perspectives. And perspectives, when it's done well, is all about shifting perspectives, people's perspectives, seeing long timelines into the future, predicting things, being able to have an intuitive process that's internal in your mind. You you are so good as, as if this is your strength at understanding how your mind works, how your mind is wired. You have an instinct, an intuition to how other people's minds are working. You can predict patterns and, and influencers way into the future because you can see how things are going to be coming down the pike. If this is your inferior process, however, so this would be for all ESPs, ESTPs, and ESFPs, use this as a three-year-old process because they have their primary process is that extroverted sensing or sensation process. So this makes this introverted intuition or perspectives process their inferior. This is something that shows up for a lot of ESPs as something in their in their life they might have some awareness around things they might have some predictability patterns they might have some ability to meditate and to really focus in and think about something in detail but is it transferable to things for example someone who uses this as a strength might be able to understand a dead language they're looking at dead languages from the past in a long timeline and they're looking back through all these dead languages they're pulling out the patterns of what the meaning was of this language based on piecing together other languages that were around the same time or however it works for for this process in that kind of environment and they're spending the time to really get down and nuanced around what the meaning of these things are based on pattern recognition or predicting something we use that example of building a highway system early on well I'm sure this process, this perspectives process, because it can think so far in the future, doesn't just build the highway system for the here and now to solve the current highway challenges, but it's thinking in terms of 50 years from now, when this city grows to a certain level, we're going to need to make sure this freeway or this highway we're building is expandable to all the other options that will need to be put in place for when the population explodes 50 years from now. So they're thinking in terms of setting up sustainability, setting up things in terms of making sure they're going to be able to be used 50 years down the road. So this long timelines, these deep meanings, the deep insight that comes from this, there might be something, if you are an ESP, there might be something that you have some skill developed around. You might be able to think in terms of expandability. Let's say you're building something or you're doing something. Maybe you've got a little bit of this in your life, but can you take it to its ultimate level? Can you take it to its ultimate expression of that cognitive function? And is it transferable? Just because you can apply it to the one thing you've built skill around can you also apply it in any context you're thrown? That's the question you'd ask yourself as an ESP if this is something that's throwing you off. Like, well, I resonate with that process. Maybe I'm not an ESP. Yeah, right. I think that when an, an SP, an ESP, is really close to someone, they have the ability to get inside their mind to some extent. So if they read a general description of introverted intuition or perspectives as the ability to see what, you know, kind of get inside other people's minds and, and have a sense of 
you know, what that person's thinking or what be able to predict what that person's patterns are. I think that might throw an ESP off by going, no, I have that ability. But the question is, can you transfer that to everyone you run into, including strangers, somebody you just met on the bus? And like you said, can you get so much inside people's minds that you're able to get inside the minds of, you know, cultures long dead and interpret their symbology? Are you able to predict how people in the future will be thinking so that, you know, I think of like Philip K. Dick novels or Isaac Asimov novels where certain technologies were predicted 50, 60 years before they came on the scene. And it's the ability to get so much inside the minds of people that you can understand what like the world that they'll be occupying in the future or the world that they did occupy in the past. So that's its acme. That's at, that's where it hits the highest levels of ability. And for an ESP, again, the same questions apply. Do you feel like you have the natural talent? Do you feel like you have the skill developed? Do you feel like you have an interest in developing the skill to a point where you would change your entire life to develop that skill? Do you feel like you can not only read it, but you can also write it? And do you feel like those are transferable skills? So the criteria for all of these cognitive functions have basically been that set of questions. And if you find yourself having some skill developed in a cognitive function that is the cognitive function of your type, if you're exploring your type, and that is described as your inferior process, and you get kind of like miffed or confused because you're like, hey, I'm actually not too bad at that. Those are the questions you should be asking yourself. Do you have the natural talent to get to the highest levels? Do you have skill developed to get to the highest levels? Do you, would you change your entire life around to build those skills? Can you both read it and write it or create it in the outside world? And are those transferable to all aspects of that cognitive functions abilities? And some of these examples we gave were very impressive examples. Some of the people that I mentioned, we mentioned in this podcast, have gotten to some pretty high levels in using their inferior process. And those people, I would say, if you're one of those people listening right now, that could really throw you off. That's something you got to watch out for because you might have some really developed, impressive skill around something that ostensibly should be something that's very difficult for you to process or be a part of if it's your inferior process. And yet it shows up for you in a significant way. So I think that's just one thing to think about is if you're struggling with your type, this is something you might want to look at as you're looking through, okay, what type am I? Or if you're struggling with other people's type around you or whatever, this is something that we focus on here at Personality Hacker. We teach our students in our profile training course to also focus on these kind of things because this is where the magic lies and understanding the nuances of these things and how they show up in your personality. So what do you think? I want to hear back from you. I know this is a highly technical podcast. A lot of our podcasts are focused on personal growth and topical. And this one went really down the rabbit's hole around this inferior process. So we want to hear from you. What do you think about this? Where do you see these things showing up for you in your inferior process? You can leave a comment or ask a question directly below this podcast over at personalityhacker.com. You can also join our community of like minds over at facebook.com forward slash personality hacker or twitter.com forward slash personality hack. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. And if you're feeling particularly giving, we would request that you leave us a rating and review on iTunes. It helps us out a lot. It puts us higher in the charts. They cross promote us on other podcasts. So if you would be willing to leave a rating and review, that would be a kindness you could do for us. Oh, and subscribe to this because we got some really cool podcasts coming up in the next few months. I mean, I think they're all cool. But in the next few months, we've got some special treats. So make sure you get the subscribe button on this so you get these podcasts automatically right to your, uh, your smartphone or device you're subscribed with. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. Mm-hmm.